Stanley Kubrick released his first film, Fear and Desire, originally titled The Trap, in 1953, just eight years after the end of World War II. It's mind-blowing to think that a director who is still so culturally relevant today released their first film nearly 70 years ago. If you ask people to name Stanley Kubrick films, they will more than likely forget about Fear and Desire, or may even not have ever heard of it. There is a good reason for that, and it would make Stanley happy to know that it has been forgotten by most, as he had a strong dislike for the film and removed it from circulation. He even went as far as trying to destroy the print. For that reason, I do feel a bit conflicted covering it as my pilot episode and potentially giving it some exposure, but hey, that fits in with the theme of Stanley Kubrick as a filmmaker, the constant battle between good and evil. Welcome to the films of Stanley Kubrick. I'm sorry, Dave. I'm afraid I can't do that. What's the problem? I think you know what the problem is just as well as I do. What are you talking about? This mission is too important for me to allow you to jeopardize it. Fear and Desire was an extremely low-budget affair, so much so, Stanley had to use his own money, plus borrow money from his father and uncle, just to get the picture made. He also brought in people he knew to help with the film's production. His wife at the time, Toba Metz, was the dialogue director on set, as well as one of the women in the river during the fishing scene, and his high school friend, Howard Sackler, who would go on to become an award-winning writer, wrote the script. Stanley himself took on the roles of director, producer, cinematographer, editor and sound editor. The latter being the reason for the film going so over budget. Stanley filmed Fear and Desire without sound in the hopes it would be cheaper to add it later as he had done with his short films. The work involved in doing this for a feature was a lot more expensive and time consuming than expected. To quote Mr Kubrick from a 1968 interview, when I made my first film, I think the thing that probably helped me the most was that it was such an unusual thing in the early 50s for someone to actually go and make a film. People thought it was impossible. It really is terribly easy. All anybody needs is a camera, a tape recorder and some imagination. With this mentality in mind, Stanley and his small crew went to the San Gabriel Mountains near Los Angeles to film Fear and Desire. There is war in this forest. Not a war that has been fought or one that will be, but any war. And the enemies who struggle here do not exist unless we call them into being. This forest then, and all that happens now, is outside history. On the surface of it, Fear and Desire appears to be a standard war film. The four main characters are soldiers trapped behind enemy lines, but as the opening narration tells us, the film is about a fictitious war, which leads us to think that maybe the setting isn't important, rather this is more of a character study, which it most certainly is. To be more specific, people's fears and desires. The idea of duality and contradictions is what Stanley will continue to explore throughout his entire career as a filmmaker many of his films, including this one, being allegorical in nature. Yeah, this whole place is such an enormous maze. I feel like I'll have to leave a trail of breadcrumbs every time I come in. <laughs> Naturally, there are many examples of fear and desire during the film's 61-minute runtime. The four soldiers being stranded behind enemy lines. Time for night, sir. I'm going to look up later. All the twigs cracking in my head. We'll need pause for the night. And the native girl, played by Virginia Leith, being held against her will, are the main examples of fear. While Sydney, trying to, well, let's say it like it is, rape the native girl when left alone with her. If you have to hate me, please try to like me also. And Mac, played by Frank Silvera, who was the only experienced actor on set, wanting to sacrifice himself as part of the final plan to bring meaning to his life are examples of desire. Who else but me is buried under the chain of everything I ever did. The basic premise of Fear and Desire is actually very simple, which again means that more time can be spent on the characters rather than the plot. Four soldiers are trapped behind enemy lines after their plane crashes. 
They build a raft in the hope of floating down the river that runs through the front lines and get back to the safety of their side, as it were. While they wait for the cover of darkness, they spot an enemy command post which has an airstrip and aeroplane. Therefore, after a bit of persuasion from Mac the action over words type of soldier, they change their plans and decide to take out the general of the opposing side's stronghold and fly to safety using the plane. Just like the budget, the cast of Fear and Desire is tiny, and I don't mean in stature. In fact, two of the actors, Kenneth Harp and Stephen Coit, played two roles each. This may well have been a budgetary choice at the time, but because they both play the leaders and their right-hand man for both sides, Kenneth Harp plays Lieutenant Corby and the General, while Stephen Coit plays Fletcher and the Captain, it does make for some great moments of reflection. No one is right or wrong, they are essentially the same people on two different sides of the war. There's a great moment near the end where the lieutenant sees the general up close and realises this. Then they were dead. And they knew it. We were so well prepared for death that the armistice was a mutual disappointment. There's only one character that succumbs to both the emotions of fear and desire, and that's Sidney, played by Paul Mazursky in his first acting role. He shows the most fear throughout the whole film. Due to this constant fear, he doesn't even attack the enemy soldiers with the others when they encounter them in the hut. He takes the stance of a pacifist. Then, whilst left alone with the woman they are holding captive in fear of her alerting the nearby general, he tries to seduce her, but when that doesn't work, let's just say his desire gets the best of him. There is a joke there about him being a lover, not a fighter, but I can't say it would be in good taste. Once his emotions do eventually get the best of him, he completely loses it and goes mad, running into the forest screaming. As we are talking about the perfectionist Stanley Kubrick, you would expect a film of exceptionally high quality, but sadly, while Fear and Desire was complimented by some critics for Kubrick's filmmaking potential, the film was not received particularly well when it was released in 1953. Stanley himself famously hated the film. He referred to it as an amateur student film. In fact, he went out of his way to try and destroy the print, but a copy was made and that is the one that still survives and is being preserved by the Library of Congress. Is Fear and Desire one of Stanley's great films? Well, that's for you to decide. As I've previously mentioned, Stanley referred to it as an amateurish student film, but essentially, that's what it is. At this point, Stanley was an accomplished photographer, but he only had two short films under his belt. Stanley being such a good photographer is where Fear and Desire's strongest moments come from, Stanley's eye for framing. There are some exceptionally striking shots throughout the film. Like Stanley's exploration of the duality of mankind throughout his entire career, another trait of his is showcased in his very first film, his ability to tell portions of a story without dialogue. Stanley Kubrick was first and foremost a visual storyteller. A lot of the time in his films, dialogue complements what you are seeing rather than the other way around. No man is an island. <laughs> Perhaps that was true a long time ago, before the Ice Age. The glaciers have melted away and now we're all islands. With all that being said, Fear and Desire was Stanley Kubrick's first attempt at a feature film, and as we all know, his ensuing films are some of the greatest films ever made. Masterpieces, in fact. Even his next film, Killer's Kiss, is a big step up, even though he still wasn't too keen on it himself. Stanley Kubrick was a perfectionist, so yes, Fear and Desire must have driven him crazy when he looked back on it and saw all of its faults. It's easy to see why he wanted to get rid of it so badly when you look at it through that lens. This has been the first episode of my Films of Stanley Kubrick series. If you wish to continue the journey with me, in the next episode we will be taking a look at Mr Kubrick's second film, Killer's Kiss. Thank you very much for watching, keep exploring films for yourself, and I'll see you on the next one.